program. So with those formalities, I say we begin our debate on what is marriage, and Dr. James White is our first speaker. My dearly beloved grandfather, who was a dirt poor preacher and minister in the wild plains of Kansas in the 1930s and 40s, would have been stunned if he had ever been told that his grandson would engage in a debate on the subject of what is marriage. He couldn't have had an understanding of why that would ever become an issue, and yet here we are. But the good news is there is a clear and unambiguous answer to that question as long as you look for the answer to that question in light of an empty tomb in Jerusalem. If you are not willing to allow the one who rose from that tomb and who now sits enthroned in authority at the right hand of the Father, if you not allow him to define these issues, then you will never really come to any type of conclusion that will in any way, shape, or form cause human flourishing. It may meet some sense of desire that you might have, but it will never cause human flourishing as God intended us as his creatures. And so when you address this issue, we will start with the two clearest texts in the Bible. Now, there are lots of texts in the Bible that we may look at this evening, but as I said, if the Bible is the Word of God, and if Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be, then the answer can be found very clearly in his teaching and the teaching of his disciples. And so please turn with me to Matthew chapter 19, because here... Jesus, they're trying to draw Jesus into the current debate amongst the Pharisees on the subject of divorce. Can a man divorce his wife for any reason at all? Well, there is a division between Hillel and Shammai, the different schools, the rabbis. And they wanted to get Jesus involved in a rabbinic debate. Jesus, as normally, very wisely, does not become involved in that debate directly. But he answers the question by going to creation itself. And that's going to be vital this evening. Because every perversion of marriage, found even in the pages of Scripture, is a perversion because it does not go back to God's creative purpose. So Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 6, Jesus answered them and said, Have you not read that the Creator... From the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man tear apart. Now please notice something. The reason that there is confusion today is seen very clearly in the first words that Jesus utters. He mentions the Creator. And we now live in a culture that has no Creator. In a completely secular culture, we are autonomous cosmic accidents. We don't have a Creator. We don't have one that defines for us who we should be, what we are, what our future is, what our past has been. No, there is no creator. This is a pitiless, meaningless world when you don't have a creator. A creator who has spoken and has revealed his will. But Jesus says there's a creator. And he says, from the beginning, not not down the road, God figured out, you know, I think I'll do it this way. 
Uh, it, it looks like if, if we do it this way with marriage, that works better. I've sort of figured things out. No. From the beginning, God intended man to live in a particular fashion. And he created mankind, male and female. I'm wondering how long it's going to be in our society before these words will be considered hate speech and banned because, well, that promulgates the gender binary. Yes, if you follow Jesus, that's the only thing you can believe because that's what he taught. He created them male and female. He created them. He didn't say, would you like to be a male? Would you like to be a female? Would you like to be one of 147 other variants? No. He created them male and female, and he uses the technical terms for that. It's not some vague concept of mankind. He created them male and female. That is God's created intention, and that means it is good. And that means we need to be in line with what God considers to be good. Because of the created order, quoting from Genesis 1, Genesis 2, 24, there is a created order. And because of that created order, notice what you have. A man will leave his father and mother. It is astonishing to me today that in many states in our nation and in Europe, these terms defined by God himself, father and mother, are being redefined to where you can have multiple parents. A man will leave his father and mother. There is a natural family order from the beginning in God's creative purpose. And he is to be joined to his wife, father, mother, husband, wife. They have God-defined transcendent meanings. We are told it really doesn't matter. Hey, if you want to define wife in one way, husband in another way, that's fine for you. You're, it doesn't, you're not impacted when someone changes that. Oh, yes, we are, and we're seeing it all around us. I have been married for more than 40 years to the same woman. I am her husband. She is my wife. She is the mother of my children. She is a woman. And all of those terms have meaning and they cannot be changed. When I see a woman saying, this is my wife, I know that is not the created order. That is not what God is talking about here in his holy word. To be joined to his wife, this is what marriage is. A man leaves his father and mother and he's joined to his wife and the process has started all over again. Now he's husband She's wife, they become father and mother. This is how God ordained it to be from the beginning. And this is the interpretation of Yahweh. Not just one of many religious leaders, but if you believe in the New Testament, Jesus was God in human flesh. The New Testament writers take texts that were about Yahweh as creator and apply them to Jesus in a specific fashion. That's why he has absolute ultimate authority. Then we're told the two, not the three, not the four, not the five or the ten, the two, male and female, gender binary, become one flesh. Two females or two males cannot become one flesh in the biblical definition of one fleshness. It's impossible. The two become one flesh. God joins them together. That means marriage is a divine institution. It's a divine institution. It's the first institution that God brought about amongst mankind. 
It's that basic. It's that foundational. Now I realize if, if you have imbibed a Darwinian naturalistic worldview, this is absurd. This is just simply the, the, the way that evolution created it, and, and there's also all, all these exceptions in the natural order. So, you know, haven't you people studied science? Again, I have studied science. I was a department fellow in anatomy and physiology, but I study it in light of the lordship of Jesus Christ and the light of that empty tomb. God joins them together. It's a divine institution, a divine covenant. What is marriage? A divinely instituted covenantal relationship between one man and one woman. And it's the foundation of the family, and as a result, the foundation of any society that wishes to have the blessing of God abide upon it. If we want to have human flourishing, if we want to fulfill God's purposes and intentions in us, we will listen to what Jesus says. So Jesus, being the eternal Yahweh incarnated, is the final interpreter of the words he had first given to Moses. This is a divinely given interpretation of the Mosaic words of creation from the one who gave them. But it's not the only place we have this. We see it. This is what the Apostle Paul believed as well. We don't have time to read all of it in an opening statement, but you know the text in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. This text is again based upon this very same gender binary of creation. Quotes the same text from Genesis 2.24. We have husbands, wives, clearly men and women, and immediately after in chapter 6, fathers and mothers and children, because that's the natural order of things. But what we must see here is that Paul then draws a parallel between this mystery, as he calls it, the creative decree of God in the family, and the loving relationship of Christ with his bride, the church. And one thing is painfully clear. You cannot simply redefine the participants in the relationship of Christ and the church as you see fit. History defined those things. God's decree defined those things. These roles are fixed and immutable just as those in the marriage relationship are as well. Oh, but some will say, what about the Old Testament? I mean, look at all the, oh, 700 wives and 300 concubines, and you've got the, the, the Mosaic Code in regards to what happens in war when you, you take prisoners and, and the women and all these things. There are all kinds of marriages in the ancient world. Polygamy concubinage. But first, two items. There were always, inalterably, only two genders. There was men and there was women. There wasn't anything else. There was no idea that anyone could just go, you know, I think I'm, and then start filling in the 147 options. Two genders. Secondly, we have biblical evidence that while God allowed Israel's kings to engage in the practice, it was never his intended form, as Jesus himself said, was always a step down from what Jesus described as God's intention from the beginning, from the start, and as the record gives to us very clearly over and over again, it always led to horrific consequences. Look at what happens in David's life with Absalom. Look what happens to Solomon and his many wives being turned away over and over and over again. These lesser practices led to destruction of personal relationships and even kingly families. So everything that you find, even when the law, for example, and most people don't realize this, when the law allowed for Israelites to take a woman that, that, because they've defeated someone in battle, that was to keep her alive. If her husband had been killed in the war and you couldn't do that, she'd be left to die. So it was actually something to keep, keep life going. 
Most people don't even give that a second thought. They think about it only in the modern context. But put those things aside for a moment and ask a simple question. Why are we here tonight? What's happened? What has changed? Has the clarity of any of these texts changed? Did, did we find a manuscript where Jesus doesn't say these things in Matthew chapter 19? Did we find out that, uh, uh, that P46 doesn't actually contain uh, this section of Ephesians or something along those lines? No, none of that has happened. What has happened in our society, a society that first was founded by men who honored the Bible as a revelation from God and quoted from it as if it were. That society has said no more. We do not want the constraints of God's law upon us. We will determine these things for ourselves. And unfortunately, what has happened is the church, very often what you see, as, as, as I think it was Francis Schaeffer said, tell me what the world is saying today, and I'll tell you what the church will be saying in seven years. It's true. And all through our seminaries and Bible colleges, there is a fundamental breakdown and has been for many, many years in a belief in the consistency of the revelation of God in Scripture. It's not that our knowledge of the, what the original looked like has gotten less, it's gotten greater. But instead, what has happened is we don't believe when Jesus when Jesus said to the Sadducees, for example, have you not read what God spoke to you saying? Think about what that means. Have you not read what God spoke? Normally, when I, if I say, have you not read, the next line is going to be what I wrote in a blog article, in a book, something like that. That's not what Jesus says. Have you not read what God spoke to you saying? And then he quotes from the Pentateuch. It was written 1,400 years earlier. He held the men of his day accountable to the words of the Pentateuch as if God had spoken them directly to them. May I remind you that in Acts chapter 17, Paul informed the scholars at the Areopagus that God had determined a day whereby he was going to judge all of mankind by a man whom he chose and gave proof to everyone that that day of judgment is coming by raising him from the dead. And so the very one that held the Sadducees accountable to what the word of God said long ago will someday hold every one of us accountable as well. Is there really a lack of clarity in what scripture says on this matter? No, there isn't. And so what are we going to say when we stand before him who said the words of Matthew chapter 19? What are we going to say when we say, well, we just, we just decided that we had a better way? There is no better way. Remember what Jesus said? I am come that they might have what? Life. And they might have it more abundantly. We are living in the blossoming of the culture of death. We murder our unborn children. We disfigure and destroy the bodies of children. Go to Canada. Oh, not feeling well today? Well, here's a place you can go for euthanasia. They'll put you out of your misery. It's a culture of death. And when you destroy the institution that God has provided to us to provide to you and I that consistency, that support. But look, I'm looking in your eyes. I'm looking in the eyes of a lot of men in here, and I know you're not perfect husbands, and I certainly haven't been one either. But when I say I've been married for more than 40 years, I am so thankful for that. It says more about her than it does me. And those of you who know me know that it says more about her than it does me. But that relationship, the children that have come from it, my precious grandchildren, 
The culture of death wants to take all that away. We proclaim the culture of life. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. The one who rose from the dead has told us what marriage is. The issue for us is, will we obey what our creator has said? Or will we, to our own detriment, follow after the culture of death? That's the question this evening. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. White. I also wanted to say thank you to our host tonight, to uh, Pastor Evan. Thank you all of you for coming tonight. Um, I had thought about starting with a joke, but it's so incredibly hilarious that I didn't want to distract from this really important. So, you know, we'll save it for later. Just come see me at the end. Um, let's, let's just begin um, by talking about, I think it's really important for us as we approach this topic of what is biblical marriage. Um, you're going to notice tonight, uh, I, I assure you, a great divergence between the ways that I approach the scripture and Dr. White approaches the scripture, and probably the way some of you uh, approach the scripture as well. So I'd like to start off by first talking about what we mean by biblical, and then I want to talk about this idea of marriage. So as we come tonight to talk about this, um, again, let's start talking about this question of what is biblical. Um, now, again, most of my life growing up, I was raised Southern Baptist, licensed and ordained, um, you know, grew up in El Paso, Texas. And my whole life, the o I was only given one way to look at and think about the Bible. And it was a very long time before, I would say maybe in the last eight or nine years, um, that I suddenly realized there were other ways of approaching scripture. And so tonight I'm going to give you an example of what that is, how I now see scripture differently than I used to. I used to see it exactly the way Dr. White does, and, and again, probably many of you, the way many of you see the scriptures as well. Um, that perspective is what some call the flat Bible perspective. What that means is that the way of looking at and approaching the Bible is something like this, that the Bible is one book, and it has one author, God. And therefore, anywhere you turn in that one book, anything you read in that one book is the, the word of God. God said that. And so it all has, it's why it's called a flat Bible perspective, because every verse has equal weight and value. And again, that's the way I was taught to read and understand and study a scripture. But if you've done it that way long enough, you start to notice you run into some problems and in fact I was in a, into apologetics for many years and there's a whole said you know like a wing of uh, apologetics that's just focused on bible difficulties and I had people coming up to me all the time as a pastor saying well you know over here God says this but over here he says this I mean so which one is what should I do and so it creates that view kind of creates all kinds of you know challenges and problems at least it did for me um, and I know for many other Christians that I've talked to um, the way I came across this different view, it's the Jesus-centric view of Scripture. And I'm going to try to explain to you tonight not just what it is, but why I believe it is actually, and kind of ironically, a more scriptural or biblical way to approach the Scripture. Um, the Jesus-centric view of Scripture is something where, it, rather than take the Bible as a flat text, you would elevate the scriptures that are spoken through Jesus. And I'll explain to you why in just a minute. Um, and so therefore, it's not all equal value. It's a bit of a hierarchy. We start with Jesus, and then there's everything else. Okay? So now let me tell you why I believe it is that this is actually the way uh, that you should consider reading the scriptures. I'm going to start with the, uh, an amazing text in the Gospel of John. And many people don't notice this text you might just kind of read over it but I'm going to highlight it for you now it's verse uh, 18 in chapter 1 of the gospel of John and it's a pretty radical statement and it says this John says no one has ever seen God at any time except for the son who came to reveal the father to us or to make him known to us now think about that for a second 
those two pretty radical statements. One is no one has ever seen God at any time except for the Son. That's pretty radical. Not Moses, not Jeremiah, not Isaiah. John seems to be saying only Jesus has ever seen God, no one else. And then he makes this statement, that the second half of it, um, and that one of the reasons the, the Son came was what? To make the Father known to us. If we already had the ultimate clear picture of who the Father was in the Old Testament scriptures, why do we need anyone to come and reveal the Father to us? John seems to be suggesting that no one had ever seen God at any time. They didn't have a clear picture. And one of the main things Jesus was doing was coming to say, let me show you what the Father is really like. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is also what Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew in verse 11 and verse 27. Jesus says, no one knows the Father except for the Son and the one to whom the Son chooses to reveal the Father. Another reason why I think it's important for us to take this Jesus-centric view of Scripture is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 14, Paul again makes a very startling statement as he's talking about the way the Jewish people, his own people, read the Old Testament Scriptures. He says this, he says, to this day, the veil remains whenever Moses, and that's the law, whenever Moses is read, because only in Christ is the veil removed. Let me paraphrase what he just said right there. What he's saying is, if you try to read the Old Testament scriptures without first knowing Christ and reading those scriptures through the lens of Christ, you are guaranteed to misunderstand it, because only in Christ is that veil removed. And my favorite example of this Jesus-centric way of approaching scripture is found in the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, verse 5. You know the story. Um, Jesus goes up on a mountain with Peter, James, and John. And while they're on the mountain, Jesus is suddenly transfigured before them. They see him unveiled in all of his glory. And what's standing there with him are Moses and Elijah. Now, it's not arbitrary. It's not like, hey, guys, uh, we got to go down and meet Jesus on this mountain. Uh, John, are you busy? No, no, yeah, you can't. David, what are you doing? No, no, who's, who's ready? Moses, okay, you're free? No. Any Jewish man uh, and, and the, uh, any of those disciples with Jesus raised in the Jewish context would have immediately understood what they were seeing. Here's Moses, who stands for the law, and Elijah, who is the father of the prophets. The law and the prophets are how Jewish people speak about their scriptures. And Peter makes what I call the flat Bible mistake. He thinks he's paying Jesus a compliment. This is awesome. Man, Jesus, it's so great. Why don't we make three tabernacles side by side and honor all three of you equally? The law, the prophets, and Jesus. And how does the father respond to that statement? He removes Moses, the law, he removes Elijah, the prophets. He leaves only Jesus, and he says this, this is my son, listen to him. And it's over. The lesson's over. That's the point. And so this is the reason why we should read the scriptures through the lens of Christ. Now, when I come to this part of the discussion, quite often people are like, oh, Keith, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. I'm not sure what you're saying here because listen it sounds like what you're saying is that the old testament scriptures kind of we don't they don't have the same kind of authority for us anymore because of jesus and and i know that jesus says in matthew 17 that um that until heaven and earth disappear the scripture the, the law and the prophets will never disappear look outside i think that yep the heaven and earth is still out there well i guess the law and the prophets are still standing that's not what Jesus says. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn to it. Matthew 5, starting at verse 17. And here's what most of us hear when we read that passage. Jesus says, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, I don't know about you, I have been trained to hear what he just said. This is how I've been trained to hear that statement. Jesus says he didn't come to abolish the law. 
and until heaven and earth disappear, they'll never disappear. But that's not what he said. Most of us only notice one until statement. There are two. And, and it's, think of it this way. He begins the statement by telling you why he is here. My mission, he says, is not to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. He put a pin in that word, fulfill. I have come to what? Fulfill the law and the prophets. Then he says, and they will not disappear until heaven and earth disappear. That's the first until. But the final until is until all is accomplished. It's the same word, fulfilled, accomplished. Now think about it for a second. The only question now is, did Jesus accomplish his mission? Can you think, think about it? Was there any point in Jesus' ministry, maybe near the end, where he might have stood up and loudly said something like, it is accomplished or finished? Yes, yes, he did. He accomplished what he came to do, what he said he came to do. And according to Matthew uh, 5, 17 through 18, now the law and the prophets have been accomplished and now they are fading away, which is the reason why uh, Paul can say exactly that. Paul says that Christ is the end of the law. Uh, he says, uh, it says actually, uh, the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 8.13, that the old covenant is obsolete. And so what we need to realize is that we need to approach the scriptures, all of the scriptures, starting with knowing Christ and knowing Jesus and reading those scriptures through the lens of Christ. Now listen, uh, I know this is probably a different opinion than most of you here, but when I think about and approach the scriptures, I also recognize something. God did not write the Bible. Now that should be obvious, right? If someone asks you, who wrote Isaiah? Isaiah. Who wrote Jeremiah? Jeremiah. So God didn't write it, people did. And did they do it under inspiration? I believe so, but we also need to understand that they did so from their own perspective and from their own cultural understanding uh, of the way the world worked. And by the way, this is the way Jewish scholars approach their own scriptures when we talk about the law and the prophets in the Old Testament. There's a joke that says if you have three rabbis in a room, you know what you have? Four opinions. Because the rabbis love and celebrate the fact that their scriptures are not univocal. They don't agree on everything. They, they get excited about the fact that there is an ongoing conversation and debate between Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea and David. And they love that conversation. They love that wrestle. We need to recognize something so critically important that the Bible is a map. It is not the treasure. The Bible is a menu but it is not the meal. And when you confuse the map for the treasure, you settle for the map and you never find the treasure. If you, just, if you, just, if you treat the, the menu like the meal, you go to bed hungry. And so we need to remember this also, that the Bible does not point us back to the Bible. The Bible points us to Christ. And so I would argue, as we come to discuss this question of biblical marriage, that we, and maybe this is the wrong question, because lots of things are biblical. Slavery, genocide, patriarchy, polygamy. Those are biblical things, and what I mean by that is that the scriptures do not specifically condemn those things, and people can and do use the Bible to justify those things, right? Yes, they do. So maybe a better question is, what is Christ-like? I'm going to turn now to this word of marriage in the Bible. I want you to know that in Jewish history, in biblical times, that a wedding between a man and a woman was always a contract between two men. I'm going to say that again. In Jewish Bible history, a marriage was always a contract between two men the father of the man, and the father of the woman. You didn't go to the temple or involve the priest. It was as holy or sacred as buying a used vehicle. My wife says not to say used vehicle. Buying a piece of property from your neighbor. Um, 
And so it was an arrangement. It was almost like a business deal. And we need to recognize that. The other thing that's also shocking, I think, for many of us to realize is that in your English translations of the text, that when you read the word husband or wife or even the word marriage, that the, there is no Hebrew word for any of those words. The word translated husband in your Bible is just the word for a man. The word for wife is simply the word for woman. And the word for marriage is actually the word to take. And so a man would take a woman. By the way, you also don't find examples of a woman taking a man in marriage because that's not how it worked. And so um, we also need to realize that there are more, and, and Dr. White alluded to this, this idea of the idea that God made in the beginning man and woman. That is true. It does say that. It also says that God created day and night. And we know that when we think about day, that single word and concept day includes morning, high noon, and sundown, and every thing in between. Did God make day? Yes, he did. But day includes a spectrum of light and heat. And so it's not just male or female. Why do I bring that up? Because again, going back to Jewish history, um, Jewish rabbis going back a very long time in the Mishnah, the Talmud, classical Midrash, and Jewish law codes recognize six different genders. Six. And so it's a spectrum. Science says the same thing, by the way. Scientists say that there are more than just male and female, that there are actually, they've identified, guess what, six different genders. Well, look at that. And so it's important to recognize we're not talking about something new. We're not inventing sexes here. Sex has always been on the curve. And we used to use these terms male and female as binaries, but we are re realizing now that that is not an ac accurate representation of biology. Just one of those six classifications is intersex. They make up roughly 1.7% of the world population. If you think 1.7%, that's not that many. Well, keep in mind that 1.7% um, of the population of this planet is 156 million people. And, and just for reference, the entire country of Russia only has 143 million people. And so intersex is not a condition. It's not a disease. It's a natural byproduct of what geneticists call normal bimodal distribution. And again, intersex is only one of those six different human genders identified both by the Jewish Midrash and the Torah and the law codes, and also by scientists. And so the conclusion is this, sex is a spectrum. And intersex people, as an example, are a perfectly normal result of nature. There is no scientific rationale for medically or culturally forcing people into these binary male or female categories. And the facts are this. There are more than male and female. Some people are gay. Some are straight. Some are queer. Some are trans. Some are born intersex. But all of them are human beings. All of them are made in the image of God. And God so loves his gay, lesbian, intersex sons and daughters and children. And I believe we should too and we should allow them to love one another. Thank you. Let's start at the end and try to move backwards as we possibly can. 
Uh, we were told there were six genders. Where? I'd like to know where, which tractate. Tractate of both, what in the Mishnah uh, allegedly says these things. It was said this is in the Torah, that would be the Pentateuch. There's nothing like that there anywhere whatsoever. Um, we're told that this has been proven by science. We're not told where. I was department fellow in anatomy and physiology. I studied genetics extensively. I know what XX chromosome is and XY chromosome is. I don't know what any of the rest of these things are. I've heard a lot of people saying that experts say this and experts say that. I'd like to have a little bit something more than a vague statement along those lines. Uh, we are told that God created the day, but that makes a spectrum. Um, it's when the sun's up and when the sun's not up. That's pretty clear, pretty straightforward. That's exactly what the text was referring to at that particular point in, uh, in time. Um, I would like to address, because, because we didn't get a definition of marriage. We were told, well, you know, there are certain people that are gay. We weren't told why. And isn't it interesting? We're told we need to uh, uh, go with Jesus first. Did you hear anything about Jesus teaching these things? You didn't hear a thing. You heard, well, we're learning genetics. We're learning something like that. You didn't hear Jesus saying any of those things. Here's a question I've never gotten an answer from a progressivist on. If Jesus was God in human flesh, he knew when he was speaking that the crowds in front of him were filled with transgenders and homosexuals, right? Because we're told that's natural, so there were just as many back then as there are today, right? Why didn't he say a word to free them from the bondage they were in? Never gotten an answer. If he was who he claimed he was, he knew, because he knows the hearts of men, right? The, the red letters say that part, right? So why didn't he say a word? Because he didn't. Instead, he affirmed the law. And in fact, it is amazing, you must understand, how utterly incoherent it is to try to drive this wedge between what Paul says was the scriptures and the New Testament writings. Because all you have to do, look at your New Testament writings. The, the book of Hebrews was mentioned. Look at the book of Hebrews and see how much of it is a citation of the Old Testament, the Tanakh. You can't make heads or tails out of the New Testament without knowing what is in the Old Testament scriptures, which Paul described as being theanustos, God breathed. It's not everything that's God breathed. The correct translation there is all scripture is God breathed. There, we may have to go into the specifics about, about that. There were three texts that were given to us. Let me just give you a, a quick example. Uh, John 1.18. John 1.18 says, no one has seen God any time the only begotten God, or the unique God, monogenes theos, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has exegeted him. He has made him known. The Son is the one who reveals to us the Father. That is true because he is fully deity. He was the one who was seen by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, sitting upon the throne. See, that's a consistency between Old and New Testament. The veil over the minds of the Jews, that's removed in election and the grace of God. The transfiguration, God didn't remove Moses and Elijah. The point was that the law and the prophets all testified of whom? Jesus. It wasn't removing them. What was the first thing Jesus does in Luke chapter 24 when he rises from the dead? When he walks with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, what does he do? He opens their minds to understand what? The scriptures, Moses and the prophets. And then when he meets with the disciples after that, what does he do? He opens their minds. He, he upbraids them. He rebukes them for being so slow in not believing what? Moses and the prophets. And then shows them how he was prophesied all through Moses and the prophets, which is why when you then get into the preaching of the early church in the book of Acts, what are they quoting constantly? Moses and the prophets. So there is this, this is not a flat Bible perspective versus a Jesus-centric view. Some people call themselves uh, red letter Christians and things like that. You can't make heads or tails out of the red letters if you don't have the black letters along with them was never intended, never intended to be read in that way. That is a modern, modern idea that no one's ever thought of until recently and tried to make application. So, God did not write the Bible, except Peter said that men spoke from God 
as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's the description that he provides to us. Men spoke. Yes, they speak in their language. Anyone who's translated uh, Peter versus Second Peter, you recognize the difference between the two because there's an amanuensis involved. You know that Paul's uh, uh, phrasing and terminology isn't Peter's, isn't Mark's, isn't Luke's, so on and so forth. Everybody is aware of that. But men spoke from God. God is big enough to use his creatures and use them in their context and give us exactly what he wants us to have. So much so that when Jesus, in that same passage I meant before, mentioned before, talking to Sadducees, he based his entire argument refuting them on the subject of the resurrection on the tense of a verb that was written down 1,400 years earlier. Now you have to look at me and say, well, that was a bad argument, or admit that that means that God spoke 1,400 years earlier and he preserved his word, and now God holds men accountable for what he said. That's the only way to understand Jesus' teaching. So I haven't heard anything from Jesus. We had, isn't it amazing? What was the primary text I focused upon? Matthew chapter 19. Jesus' own words. But Jesus' own words are an inspired commentary on Genesis 2. Showing that you cannot separate what God has joined together in his word there is a consistent New Testament teaching as to what marriage is. It goes back to God's intention in creation itself. It is applied by the Lord Jesus Christ and then explicated in the relationship of Christ and his church in Ephesians chapter 5. We have heard nothing to even begin to suggest for someone who does believe that there is an empty tomb in Jerusalem, because that's the only people I can talk to here. But let me, let me, say, let me say this in closing. I say this to all people, whether you call yourself a Christian or not, if Jesus is who he claimed to be, he made you. He created you. Every breath that comes out of your mouth, every beat of your heart came from him as your creator, and he will be your judge someday. And he says, this is what marriage is. If you want the blessing of your creator, then you will believe what he has clearly revealed in his word. And we proclaim that to every culture, to every land, Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords every place on this earth. And his word is true in every one of those places. Thank you. Thank you. And... <clears throat> Yes, um, for anybody who would like, because there's not enough time in, in my opening, um, you want those references to the Jewish, um, where those come from, from the Jewish text, or, or the scientific side, the geneticists and things like that on the six different genders, um, let me know. I'll be happy to email that, all of that to anybody who would like that. Um, and I'm glad that Dr. White um, mentioned Matthew 19, because he gives me an opportunity to respond, and actually this is something I think is so important. Because what Dr. White quoted at the beginning, that's half of the story. And again, I invite you to turn to Matthew 19, starting in, in verse 4, if you have a Bible, and follow the progression of the conversation that's going on between Jesus and the Sadducees. Number one, they do not ask Jesus to please define marriage for us. That's not what they ask. They say, would you please settle this argument? Can a man divorce a woman for any reason? Now, this is addressing... A debate at the time, but it's also something that Jesus understood was a system of oppression against women. Slavery in this context was nothing more, nothing better than slavery. I'm sorry, marriage was nothing better than slavery for many women. They, men owned women. And the man, therefore, could divorce his wife for any reason. And now this was a debate that was going on amongst themselves about this. Should, is this okay? Should this uh, practice continue? So understand, Jesus is answering the question, but the way he answers the question blows their minds. Please don't miss the fact that the way he answers the question creates a controversy. And he, so because this was such an oppressive system to women, only the man could decide at any reason, you know what, I'm done with you. She's younger, she's prettier, I, I don't want to deal with you anymore. And that was a death sentence for many women. 
as Dr. White mentioned, in that culture. She'd be either begging or prostituting herself to survive. And so this was a very oppressive system that Jesus wants to correct because all the power is in the hands of the husband. And therefore, when Jesus answers the question by saying, here's the only reason you can divorce your wife, for the cause of adultery. The balance of power just shifted to the woman. Because what he just said to the men was, it's not your decision anymore. It's only for the cause of adultery. It means if your wife decides the covenant of marriage is done, I'm done with you. I'm going to go with this other guy. Now the marriage is over. It's not up to you anymore. Now you say, well, now the man could commit adultery. Yes, but that would bring shame on the man and he would never do that. And so Jesus is attempting to correct something that is oppressing women. Which is actually, by the way, it really makes me angry that today, today, Christian ministers will say to a woman in an abusive marriage, oh no, Jesus said you can't divorce your husband unless it's for adultery. And they'll use a text that Jesus was intending to give women power and agency to put them back under an oppressive husband. So understand, number one, that is what's happening. That's, that's the way he answers the question. But after he says this, okay, look at the reaction of his own disciples. They say, what? If that's the way it's going to be, why get married at all? And Jesus doesn't correct them. He doesn't say, guys, 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 no, you're taking it too far. I don't mean that. No, it's, we know it's a wonderful thing, you know, pro-family. Pro, pro we got to do this. This is a great thing we got to do. No. His own disciples say, why get married at all? And he says, you know what? While you're thinking about that, think about this. It might be something too much for you to consider right now. You might not be able to handle it right now, but consider this, that there are eunuchs who are born that way. There are eunuchs who are made that way, and there are eunuchs who become this way for the kingdom of God. And again, understand, under the Jewish understanding, when I talked about those six different types of genders, Jewish rabbis understood a eunuch, which are mentioned in the Old Testament, uh, and are in the Torah, they understood a eunuch as a third type of gender, not male and not female, but something in between. And so Jesus, again, blows their minds again. And so what he's saying is, again, it's following the pattern that Jesus does throughout his entire ministry, okay? He says, you have heard it said, and he quotes the scriptures, and then he says, but I say to you, and he says something that twists a little bit. Then, whoa, what, what's going on here? By the way, it's the reason why at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, if you've ever read it, it's, it's amazing to notice it from beginning to end, that he does that so often that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says the people were amazed. Why? Because he spoke with authority. That's the authority that they were noticing. Because the Pharisees would never stand up and say, you have heard it said, but I'm going to tell you something else. But Jesus did, and this was his pattern. And here he does it again. Oh, you want to know about divorce? Can a man divorce a woman for any reasons? Yeah. Okay, so let's quote Genesis. You know, you have heard it said. I'm going to quote Genesis. But why get married at all? Because there's this other, I'm going to, Jesus acknowledges a third gender type. And so, yes, perhaps the poster children for the old covenant way of thinking was the man and the woman in marriage. But Jesus talks about something now for the kingdom, which is a eunuch, which is a, a third type of gender. That's the complete teaching that Jesus gives. You have heard it said, but I say to you. And he even acknowledges, this might be too much for you to handle right now, but I'll just put a pin in it. Think about it. Consider this, that there might be something other than the heteronormative male and female way of coming together. There could be this other thing, this eunuch a third gender type, and I want you to consider that. That is what Jesus says. That's the complete teaching in Matthew there. I think what's also fascinating um, that there's a beautiful thing that happens about eunuchs. In Isaiah, there's a promise God makes to eunuchs. It's God says, one day I'm going to give to eunuchs a blessing greater than that of children. But we don't see anywhere that that promise was ever fulfilled. Here in Matthew, Jesus brings up eunuchs again, and he brings up eunuchs again in this beautiful way of suggesting there is this other thing we need to consider about welcoming them into the kingdom of God. And I find it fascinating that the very first non-Jewish convert to the Christian faith in the book of Acts was an Ethiopian eunuch 
who is in this chariot reading what? The scroll of Isaiah. We even know what part he's reading because he has a specific question about it, and Philip answers the question. And what we know is that after he came out of the water and Philip was gone, he got back in his chariot. No doubt he continued to read that scroll of Isaiah. And the beautiful thing is that Ethiopian eunuch would come across that promise in Isaiah saying to him, God has a promise for eunuchs that is greater than that of children, fulfilling not only what Isaiah said, but what Jesus says to his own disciples in Matthew. I submit that following Christ compels us to say, yes, it is written but what has Christ said to us? Thank you. a minute to stretch their legs or looks like go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not hearing you, but I can hear me. Okay, we're going to we're going to we're going to resume the debate. So, if you could, please find your seat. If you're still milling about, please find your seat. Okay, we've gotten to the really fun part of the debate, the cross-examination. Uh, each side will have two 10-minute uh, segments, and just a reminder to ask direct questions and try to answer uh, directly without asking a, a question in response. And 
Uh, Dr. White will go first. We'll go back and forth uh, for your first 10-minute session. So go ahead. Thank you. Since it's what everybody is thinking about toward the end of your last uh, statements, um, you said that eunuchs are mentioned in the Old Testament law. Uh, what specifically is said about them? Um, I believe there's a passage about how they're not allowed to enter the temple. I think it's in a passage um, in Leviticus, if I'm not mistaken. Um, thank you. It says something about um, how the lame or those who have mental illness or any other kind of birth defects or infirmities or if they are eunuchs are not allowed to enter the temple of God. So if there is a um, physical deformity of the male sex organ, this individual was not allowed in the congregation of Yahweh. Is that correct? Um, I would say yes. I think that that's the way they understood what, what they were saying was that this person must have had a deformity. Yes. Okay. And you are saying that that is a third gender? I'm saying that that is the way Jewish um, teachers understood that. to be. They understood that as not a male or a female, but something in between, a third what gender. What Jewish teachers? I can't name them by name, but I can show you the research that, is, that I've looked at from not just one single source, that there are a but when, series. When, but when did they write? When did they write? When, what, what time period? Um, there are old, uh, going back into the um, Midrashes, um, there are references in the Torah um, but to these, to the Torah is as Moses, being, right? Yes, the Talmud, I'm sorry. Misspoke. Okay, right. The Talmud. I think you might have misspoken earlier when you yeah. said... Uh, okay, I apologize. Uh, the Talmud. Okay, all right. I think that's an important clarification. Yes, make. thank you. Okay, so, uh, so these, uh, the, 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 uh, the Mishnah, Gemara, and then the final Talmud, these are many, many, many centuries after Christ, right? They were written down that, at that time, yes, but I believe the understanding from the Jewish people is that these were um, things that had been passed down for quite a long time, before the, the written copies of what we have now. But we have in the Mishnah uh, material from 250 to 300 years after Christ. Yeah. Is there anything in there that uh, is, is substantiates any other view than a one man, one woman, gender binary marriage relationship? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, all right. Um, in Matthew chapter uh, 19, uh, I, I need to, I, am I correct in, hearing from your comments that you don't agree that Jesus is establishing the normative reality of a gender binary in creation in verse 4. Is that true? Um, I would say what, what I'm saying is that Jesus is, um, he's doing that pattern of what he continually did. You have heard it said, and then he would quote the scriptures, and then he would say, sort of, an, but I say to you. So he's not negating it. He's agreeing with them, um, the Sadducees. This, this is their perspective, yes, answering their question about specifically, can a man divorce a woman for any reason? He quotes the Genesis passage. But I think just by, by virtue of the fact that in that same conversation, it's in that same context. It's not another day. It's not the next day. It's not another chapter. Um, it's in that same context of that question about uh, where he quotes Genesis, the, the very virtue of the fact that Jesus would bring up what I believe many Jewish people would have understood as being a reference to a third gender type and honors it and says that this is something he understands is probably beyond their ability to, to grasp. Um, by virtue of the fact that he brings that up, I think he is introducing some new idea. Okay. Um, but you just admitted that you don't have anything for hundreds of years after Jesus that would have indicated that that is how they would have understood what he said, right? Um, I would say that, again, what I quoted earlier, that um, there are multiple sources, Jewish sources, rabbis, um, I believe before Jesus and after Jesus, not just after Jesus, that affirm this, the six different gender types. Who? I don't, I don't okay, have their okay, names, but okay. I can, if you want, okay. I can read you the names of what they are okay. in the Hebrew. All right. I can do that. Um, but you just, said, you, just, you just said that in Matthew chapter 19, you said that Jesus is doing the same thing he did when he said, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. Is that how you understand verse 4? I think it's, um, I think it's following a similar pattern, yes, because but, I think Jesus establishes a pattern in his teaching where quite often he will quote Moses, um, but then he will suggest something um, that's a radical... Uh, but when he says, you have heard it said, he's referring to the rabbinic interpretation, is he not? He's quoting Genesis. 
not, not in Matthew 19. He doesn't say, you have heard it said. He says, have you not read? Yeah. That's completely different than you have heard it said. Right, but it's the same kind of pattern. It's the same thing he does in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, you, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. Is, that's not something that he, they heard said. That is something that they would have read in, in the Old Testament scriptures. So when, when later on in Matthew, in this, with dealing with the Sadducees, when Jesus says, have you not read what God spoke to you? He's clearly referring there to reading scripture, not to simply rabbinic interpretation, right? Yes, in the context okay. of answering their very specific question about can a man divorce a woman for any reason? No, that was later on in Matthew when he's talking to the Sadducees about the resurrection. It's different, completely different context. Here in Matthew chapter 19, he's not saying, you have heard it said, but I say to you. He says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So he is specifically quoting from Scripture and holding them accountable to it and not changing anything. How do you get a, how do you get your, your how, how do you substantiate the assertion that what is clearly a citation of scriptural authority is being changed into, I am changing this now? Where, where do you get that from the text? Well, again, in the same way that in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says, and he quotes an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth or things like that, um, or when he says, you know, God sends rain on the just and the unjust, which is a direct contradiction to do what Moses says in Deuteronomy. He follows that pattern. When he's speaking specifically um, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he will quote their scriptures, but then he will offer a corrective or something to, um, to advance those ideas farther than they are comfortable. He even says that in the text when he says, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it is given. For some are eunuchs because they're born that way, others were made that way, Others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven, and the one who can accept this should accept it. So Would don't you, you, I'll ask you when it's my turn. <laughs> yes. Don't you see that you are uh, taking the initial answer that he gives, then the disciples respond to that and react to that, and then Jesus is now addressing their question, but you're taking this later discussion and reading it back into the actual answer that Jesus gave. And the result is we don't know what the answer he gave actually means. He's, does it, does it, can we agree that Jesus taught that the scriptures teach that God created man, male and female? Uh, when he's quoting that text, haven't you read that at the beginning the creator made them male and female? Yes, he's quoting that text. Yes. Oh, okay. To answer a specific question about can a man divorce a woman for any reason. So it shouldn't shock us that he's quoting something that specifically is talking about a man and a woman. And so he answers with a creative creation mandate and then makes application verse 5, right? Yes, he does. And if the gender binary is not a part of the foundation of his answer, then verse 5 doesn't make any sense, does it? Because it says this reason a man shall leave his father and mother. There's no third gender, there's no six genders, there's only two, right? Yeah, and if they had asked him about something like that, then that would have made sense, but they specifically ask him, can a man divorce a woman for any reason? Right. So and he so answers uh, in, by quoting scriptures about a man and a woman. Why would we expect him in that answer? But a okay. few sentences later- Is there later, anything else he could have quoted that would have said anything differently? Well, no, because Again, this, this, as I said in my opening, um, we're not, we shouldn't be looking at something to say, is it biblical? We should be saying, is it Christ-like? Because Christ, Jesus does come, and one of the things that Jesus does is he reforms our ideas and our views of who God is and what God is like. And so this is a, a situation where, yes, he begins by answering their question and saying, okay, yes, can a man divorce a woman for any reason? Yes, and here's a verse about a man and a woman cleaving, you know, leaving your father and mother, cleaving to your wife. But the, then he, the answer, because he gives it the way he does, and now taking power out of the man's hands in the, in the marriage relationship, now they are no longer able to oppress women in this way. Is it, there anything about it, power or oppression same, in this text? It's the same answer. It's the same conversation. The fact that he just turns to his disciples and addresses their shock at what he said 
Jesus isn't only talking to one audience here. He's, he's talking to the Jewish leaders, but he also has his disciples right there with him. That's part of their being his disciples. He's why, teaching them. Why am I wrong to say that you are contradicting yourself glaringly by saying we need to go with the red letters, but then you're interpreting the red letters in the light... I have no idea what that's all about. Was it? You're kidding. Sure, no, please. Why, why would I be incorrect in saying that you're contradicting yourself because you said we go with Jesus, and yet now your interpretive lens for interpreting Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 is 21st century um, uh, viewpoints of oppression and power? It was oppression. You yourself even said it in your opening statement that um, the reason why when they took spoils of war was because these women would be left to fend for themselves and would probably starve to death and would have no man to take care of them. And so because that was a continuation right. of, a, of that system, Jesus is correcting that it was an oppressive system against women. And so when Jesus says you can, that you, you can only divorce for the cause of adultery, he's putting power back in the hands of the woman. And it's evidenced by the fact that his own disciples decide, why get married at all? Yes. Where to begin? All right, so let me make sure I'm timing myself as well. Um, let me see. Um, where would you say that the Bible instructs us that the Bible is our ultimate authority? Uh, the Lord Jesus himself uh, tells us that by, by his very example, you know, I gave you Matthew chapter tw uh, 22. Have you not read what God spoke to you saying? Uh, that's repeated by, by uh, Peter. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. A uh, constant reference to the scriptures. In fact, for the Apostle Paul, graphe, grammata, um, these are all standard terminologies that everybody knew was in reference to uh, the scriptures that were in the possession of Timothy and Paul. And Paul says they are theonistos, they are God breathed. And that for Timothy to do the works of the man of God, he is referred to one thing, to the Theonustos scriptures. Um, so then how would you respond to the fact that Jesus says in Matthew 28 um, that our ultimate authority is him? He well, says because all authority... he's the one that gave us the scriptures. He's, he's God speaking. It's God's word, so it's his, it's his word. That's... He, he's the one who, who created us, made us, sustains us, and so he, is, he cannot be separated from, from that which he has given to us. I do believe fully in the deity of Christ, that Jesus Christ is the incarnate Son of God, that he is Yahweh in human flesh. Okay. Do um, we agree on that? I guess I'll ask that no, question I'm, later. No, well, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can ask that question later. You might later. get asked that again. Well, um, yes, uh, I do say that slightly, a little bit differently, so if you want, you can ask me that. Um, do you, would you, do you feel like there's ever any place where Jesus either contradicts the Hebrew scriptures, and you, you probably wouldn't go that far, or, um, or modifies the Hebrew scriptures um, using this authority that he has because he is uh, Christ, the Son of God? No, obviously what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount is not modifying the Hebrew scriptures. He is uh, rebuking the traditions of the elders that have been added to the scriptures and have become the lens through which the scriptures have been viewed. So the prophets did the same thing over and over again. God gave them the sacrificial system, and yet they then turned it into a, a business venture that no longer represented individuals who are repentant for sin. So it's the same thing that Micah does, that Hosea does, and Jesus does it with, um, uh, with the developments especially taking place from, uh, with the Pharisees after, during the intertestamental period. Um, what about in, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus makes this statement, um, he's, he's giving essentially the reason for, for his, his statement of why you should turn the other cheek, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you. Um, and then he says, um, because God sends rain on the just and the unjust, um, do you not see that as a direct contradiction of what Moses says in Deuteronomy about God sending rain only on the righteous, but drying up and sending drought on the fields of the unrighteous? 
No, there's two different contexts. One is talking about blessing and cursing. The other is talking about common grace. Um, when, when God causes it to rain, like he did today, um, uh, it, it, it rained on my nice, pretty Christian truck, just like everyone's pagan truck. <laughs> uh, so right. so that's, a, that, that, that's, just, that, that's just the context of, of, of that. Uh, the blessings and cursings in Deuteronomy, that's a completely different context in the sense of uh, I will bless your crops, I will curse those who rebel against me, etc., etc. So there's, there's two different ways of recognizing uh, God's providence in those, those situations. Um, okay, uh, so let me ask you this. Um, 50 years ago, we could be sitting in a church like this debating whether or not we as Christian pastors or ministers should marry um, a white person and a black person. And in fact, 50 years ago, that is what Christians debated. Um, and it was difficult for many Christians to, uh, who didn't, who thought it was okay to do that, to make an argument because there's like 15 different passages in the, in the scriptures that actually command uh, God's people not to marry people of other races. So here we are today arguing a different subject and you said in your opening um, that for us to change our minds on something as fundamental as this question of marriage, um, that we would need sort of like this overwhelming biblical support. We'd have to do some exegesis. We'd have to find some proof that God didn't say this or, oh, my gosh, God said this other thing and we misunderstood it. So what, how would you, um, in the time we have remaining, how would you, using only the Bible, argue that slavery is wrong. Okay, you, you presented a, a bunch of different things there. Uh, when you say we would have been arguing uh, uh, whether blacks and whites uh, could marry, uh, my first best friend, his father was the blackest man I've ever seen, and his mom was albino white. So that's never been an issue for me, and I would have debated anybody, and uh, so would have my parents, and so all, all sorts of other folks like that. There is absolutely, my friend, no way to parallel the clarity of the Bible's teaching on the nature of marriage with the abuse of scriptures in regards to something like that because we clearly have the over and over again repeated statement in scripture that there is neither male nor female, notice gender binary, not there's 447 genders, but there's neither male nor female, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, Scythian, that's a race, um, all are one in Christ Jesus. And so you have the clarity of that statement along with the clarity of the teaching of the entirety of the Bible on the gender binary in marriage. And so comparing the two of them is simply an impossibility, but then you switched from the illustration to slavery. And uh, the argument there would be what kind of slavery are we talking about? Because the scriptures allowed for slavery in war, and again, it was to preserve life. And people don't understand that. If, you're, if your husband and your culture or your, your city has been wiped out and you, you, you're not going to have any means of, of, of preserving life. So God has always been about preserving life. Even in situations where you were living in a culture that could not produce the amount of food that would allow people to stay alive without those support structures. So the issue is, are we talking about Roman slavery? Are we talking about Greek slavery? Are we talking about man stealing? Are we talking about those types of slavery? It's very clear what it says there. But slavery has existed throughout human history, continues to exist today, and God's word actually addressed it and said this is the only way that this can exist for the purpose of life. And we're afraid to say that. I'm not afraid to say that. There, I don't believe there's such thing as problem passages in this book. There are just passages that I'm not willing to submit myself to. So is there a specific place where God tells them, the, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, to take slavery for the specific reason of preserving life? Well, when, when you say for the specific reason, everyone would have known exactly why that was necessary. Everyone would have known what would happen if you did not do that. They were allowed to do that. And, but it was only within those certain confines. That was a... You know, you can say, well, it doesn't say for the preserving of life. Well, everybody who was reading would have understood exactly that because everybody understood what happened in war and what would, what would take place once a city, like a city-state or something like that, was destroyed. 
Um, but when the, when the scriptures talk about slavery, they, in, like in Leviticus, it also makes, God seems to make um, a provision not just for, uh, as you're saying in the spoils of war, um, for, for if, you, if it even is the case that it was for preserving of life, I think that's, uh, that's debatable. But um, there was also the encouragement of permanent slavery. Um, in other words, like you would, if you took someone as a slave who was uh, another Jewish person, there was a time frame on that. Mm-hmm. After a certain time, they could win their freedom. But if they or they could remain. Right, or if they wanted to remain, they could, mm-hmm. yes, the, the, the all on the ear, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was also provision for permanent slavery, that, that that person would be a slave forever. And do you see that as something that would be, is that moral? Is that acceptable? Is that... Is that for the reason of saving their life? It still seems like it's more for the purpose of making that person a slave forever. My Lord and Savior who rose from the dead said that God's law is good and just and right and that not a jot or tittle of it would fall. Um, And he was the one that gave that uh, law. And so I am going to trust his goodness in any situation where I do not have the information to answer any question about a specific example in history. I can trust God to be good because he always has been. Okay. Do I have time to ask one more? Sure. <laughs> um, in the time we have left, isn't well, it, sorry, isn't it true that the kind of marriage that we have today, um, even in, Christian, in the Christian sense, isn't necessarily biblical? Wow, and, you, and we're, we're really going to go over on that one. You, you, it, it, there was 16 seconds when I you said over, go ahead, so I, went, I get to go long on that one. Go so, for it. Yeah. We went over, went a little long yes, we did. Yes, 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 we did. yes, yes, yes. Um, you're talking about the differences in societally in regards to the roles fathers played with, uh, with their daughters and the arranging of marriages and everything else. The point is that those marriages had a husband and a wife and they were part of the gender binary, and they produced children that called them fathers and mothers. And that is the whole point of what the issue in our society today is, is can we redefine what a father and a mother is, what a husband and a wife is, willy-nilly, or will we bring about our own destruction in the process of so doing? How those uh, marriages were contracted, at what time, hey, We've all seen uh, Fiddler on the Roof, so we know how this all works out in the end. Uh, and it was wonderful and it was beautiful, but in each one of those instances, it was a male and a female. And that is what is necessary in light of Jesus' own teaching. Okay. I want to take a short break just to, not to go to the bathroom, uh, <laughs> just to uh, say that if you have questions, this would be a good time to start writing them. Uh, if you want to go ahead and send some in quickly so that I can start to organize them, do that. So if my volunteer could come and gather questions at the aisle. I'm talking 10 seconds here. So if you have one ready to go, if my volunteer would gather them in the center aisle. Give me a head start on reading a few and sorting a few out. Oh, of course. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we, will be, we will be gathering... Shh. We will be gathering questions again, so this isn't your only chance. I'm just getting a few on the front end. Um, And if they're not legible, don't even send it in. (laughs) Print. I'm just trying to get a head start on the questions. So at at the end of of this cross-examination period, I'll gather the rest uh, of your questions. We'll get to as many as we can. But their chances are very low. (laughs) Their chances are low. Okay, I'd like to start our our next uh, 10 minute uh, session here. Just just set them right here. Perfect, thank you so much. Again, we'll collect more in 20 minutes, whenever you're ready. I will uh, go ahead and uh, ask the question uh, that uh, we made reference to earlier. Um, You said you would not use the terminology that I use in regards to the person of Christ. do you not hold to what would be a, considered to be a, a Nicene definition of Jesus Christ being the eternal Son of God um, in the sense of a unique relationship to the Father? I don't recall saying that I had a different viewpoint on Jesus with you. I said I, I approached the scriptures differently. Um, so, no, I wouldn't have a problem affirming uh, 
the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed or... So Jesus is Yahweh incarnate? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's that. That was... Uh, would, you, uh, would you say that he has a unique authority that no other religious leader, Buddha or any of the Zoroastrians or anyone else uh, would possess? As far as I'm concerned, yes. Okay. As far as you're concerned? Well, you're asking me, so I'm telling you what I, what I believe, yes. Okay. Uh, all right. But if, if he truly is the incarnate one, our opinion of it doesn't change whether... Well, what I'm saying is that, yeah, I believe that and I would affirm that. But obviously not everyone does. Okay. Uh, when we go back to, uh, we, we were trying to work our way through uh, the issue, and I was uh, basically trying to, to say to you that in Matthew chapter 19, uh, the end of Jesus' answer is verse 6. Is that not correct? When he says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Is that, is that an answer that remains uh, valid and binding upon everyone today? Or just Christians? Um, well, that's, that's kind of uh, maybe the nuance of what we're trying to discuss here tonight. Um, obviously, if you're not a Christian, then those scriptures, those words, don't have the same kind of authority for you. Um, I don't agree, though, that that's the end of the question, because he, he answers in verses 4 and 5 and 6. Then they ask a follow-up question. Did Moses, why, why did Moses give the command to give his wife a cert cert certificate of divorce to send her away? And he answers, he, he clarifies that, and then the conversation continues. That is not the end of the conversation. So we're, we're, we're multiple questions down the road now. But the end of his, when he stops speaking, he says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Is marriage numerically limited to two? No, I, I don't agree that that is what's being asked of Jesus in this passage. He's not being asked... He's not, they don't say, please define marriage for us. And then he says, oh, well, let me tell you, marriage is between a man and a woman. He, he, there, is a, there is a conditional thing. They're asking about marriage between a man and a woman. And could that relationship between a man and a woman end in divorce for any reason? And then in reaction to that, he answers that question. But Jesus never even says divorce, does he? They do. It's right. the question that and they're asking. And his answer is to go back to creation. Right. And in the creation narrative, he says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Is that the creation standard for mankind for all time? Uh, I would say it's the standard for men and women in in a marriage between a man and a woman. If they... if if. If you ask me how to make orange juice, and I mention specifically water and orange juice, I'm answering your question, and I'm talking about the ingredients of orange juice, which is water and orange juice, uh, maybe some sugar. But uh, it, it's, it's a specific answer to a very specific question about what happens at the end of a marriage between a man and a woman. And yet, he doesn't talk about divorce. Instead, he talks about, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. The last line refers to not man being able to separate, but everything that came before that is fundamental creation ordinance. Are you saying it's not creation ordinance? That, this, that there would be people for whom it is not true? that they are no longer two but one flesh? Do you, believe, do you believe that two men can become one flesh? Not in the same sense that it's being talked about here, but again, I, I think there's a context going back to Genesis of why, what is the context of that, of that scripture? It's the, you know, we only have two people, Adam and Eve, that have just been created, um, and then they are given this command to be fruitful and multiply. And it's in that context that the man and the woman would, the man would cleave to his wife 
and they would bear children, and they would, you know, multiply and subdue the earth. I mean, let's fast forward. We're like 7.4 billion people. We did it. Good job. I think we accomplished our goal. Um, but that was where it began. And to accomplish that command, that goal to be fruitful and multiply, that's why a man and a woman would become one flesh. There was, there was a purpose behind that statement and that command. You said at the end of your opening statement, um, well, I, ha I haven't had actually a definition from you of what marriage is. I've certainly given mine. Um, what is your definition of marriage? Um, I guess my definition, um, take it with a grain of salt, but I guess for me, my definition of marriage would be a, um, a loving relationship between two people who um, provide companionship to one another, um, who are helpers to one another, um, and in the case of a male and female relationship, that could include bearing children, but there are many people who are married, um, male and female, that do not and cannot bear children. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't see the procreation aspect of the marriage relationship as being something that is necessary, even in heterosexual relationships. But so, you said people, so you, your definition would include homosexual marriage? Yes, same-sex marriage. Okay, is there anything in the Old Testament that would give that definition? No, because as, as I also said in my opening, the question, is it biblical, I believe, um, leads us down uh, the wrong path. Okay, so... I, I would I again, am pointing us to, again, back to Matthew 19, where Jesus, in a conversation about marriage between a man and a woman, um, introduces this idea of a third type of gender acknowledges that it's something that not everyone can accept, especially at that time uh, in history, but ends by saying that those who can accept this should accept it. And you think that he's still defining marriage uh, two questions down? I think he's um, asking us to um, do what he says at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which is metanoia in the Greek, which is quite often translated as repent, but that word metanoia doesn't mean feel sorry for your sins, it means think differently. Means and change of direction, right? Yes, it's okay. yes, but uh, not just in your behaviors, but in the ways that you think. So, is there anything else in Jesus' teaching where you actually believe he is defining marriage that would include um, uh, two men, two women? Anywhere else? Um, other than this passage, no. I think he's simply planting the seed because, as he says, when he makes the statement, he knows that this is something that they're. I mean, they they can barely handle the idea that a that a, the man can only divorce the woman for the cause of adultery, which freaks out even his own disciples. And so to make this next suggestion, right, he carefully suggests, hey, there's something else beyond what you're currently willing to receive. And when did that and, seed grow and, and bear fruit? Is it um, in Paul, Peter, James, Luke, um, anybody? Yeah, I, well, I think maybe it took a very long time for us so to recognize. outside the New Testament. Yeah. I think it took a very long time and is still taking a very long time. In the same way it took, it has taken, uh, it took a very long time for um, Christians to settle the question of slavery. Okay, because so. Because from the scriptures, it's very difficult to use the scriptures to make a case that slavery is a sin and we shouldn't take slaves. I <clears throat> disagree hardly, but. Um, so you think so it's okay when, to take when slaves? The apostle, when the Apostle Paul says that. Uh, those who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. He just missed the, uh, he missed the seed? Um, well, the word homosexual didn't appear in any English translation of the Bible until 1946. But we all know what arson equites means. So. Uh, yes, it, it means, um, it, it's a reference to temple prostitution. Going back, yes it is. No, it's not. And that's, that, by the way, and look that up, that's Matthew Henry, that's, I mean, many other, um, if, if, many even conservative Christians um, have always translated that those two words, so there's two words that, that have been translated as homosexual in your English translations, um, Malakoi and Arsenokotai. Um, again, let's keep in mind that there were 15 other words in the Greek that referred to different types of same-sex relationships that would be closer to what we would consider to be a homosexual relationship, and yet Paul has to reach back and practically invent a word or synecotai to refer to something, and whatever he was referring to, what we know is it wasn't one of those other 15 words that were specifically about something we would call homosexuality. We're out of time. Thank you. But you have another 10 minutes to ask that. Okay. Don't ask me about that. <laughs> um, 
So I want to ask, can, well, I guess I should start. Do, do you believe that Jesus was pro-family? Pro-family? Yes. He created the, he, he, he's the one doing the creation in Genesis 2, so yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I'm speaking more specifically about his, his teachings in the New Testament and the Gospels. Well, um, the, I see a consistency. Do, and would you, could you also make a case that Paul is pro-family? Very much so. Okay. So then what do you do when Paul says things like he wishes everybody would be like him and be celibate and not get married, um, that the only reason really that he recommends getting married is if you're burning with lust, um, almost as if if you want to kill your passion, get married, that'll do it. Um, because, it's, again, I, I, I see Jesus... Um, introducing at least the possibility of these eunuchs within the context of the kingdom. I see Paul being someone um, who actually suggests the, the followers of Christ not get married and remain celibate as he was. So I, I, I'm, how, where do you see Paul being pro-family? Uh, well, uh, look at Ephesians chapter 5. <laughs> I, I made reference to it. Um, you have husbands, wives, children. Uh, you have Christ, being, uh, Christ and his bride, uh, the, the church. Uh, you have families there. When he uh, defines uh, the elders and the deacons, he talks about the fact they should be husbands of one wife, children under control. Uh, it's just a given all the way through. When you, when you, again, when you allow the scriptures to be the scriptures and to be harmonious with one another, then you recognize this consistency. Um, and then, very clearly, when the apostle goes through the Ten Commandments, one of the things that he identifies uh, when he talks about the sexual sins, when he goes to, you shall not commit adultery, uh, is he specifically refers to all different forms of fornication, pornaya, and he does draw uh, from the Old Testament text and gives us a word that means what men do with men in bed. It's derived from Luke, Le Le Leviticus chapter 20 and Leviticus chapter 18. There is no question about this lexicographically from Hebrew or from Greek, this is, uh, I, there is just absolutely no question about it, and that's why I have challenged all the creators of the 1946 movie to debate, and they won't do it, because they will lose badly. I would love to see that debate. Oh, I would too. I know those guys. I'll see if I can set it Good, up. Good, set I'll, it up. All right, let's. Host. let's You'll host. <laughs> awesome. Are, there, there, are, you, are you listening? Okay. I, th I think Michael Brown and Bob Gagnon would uh, want to get on that too, so. Right. Um, okay. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, Seven minutes and nine seconds. All right. Um, all right, so let me ask you this. Um, You're distracted. <laughs> so do you see any places um, throughout the scriptures where God gave a specific command about something and then later um, made an exception to that command? I'm not sure what you mean by exception. I mean, er, er, Christian theologians down through the ages have recognized that when you look at God's law, for example, you have aspects of the ceremonial law that have been completely done away with and therefore uh, uh, are, are finished in Christ, so on and so forth. Um, but the law as a moral uh, command is not what is done away with in the Old Covenant. Uh, you made that statement in, in your opening, and I didn't get around to refutation of it, but um, when Hebrews 8 is talking about the, the old passing away, it's not talking about, it's impossible for that to be the Old Testament law in its morality because Paul then turns around and utilizes those very same uh, uh, commandments uh, when he says to the Corinthians uh, how they are to behave and how they are to behave sexually. And he uses examples over and over again. The, the writer of the Hebrews does the same thing. So, um, I think we have to be very careful. Uh, I think we, we, we would really do that very differently in our understanding of how that works. Yes. Um, so, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7, um, Paul gives us, he, he does this twice, actually. He also does something very similar in Galatians 4. Um, he provides pretty stark contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Um, and do you not see that as Paul critiquing um, the Old Covenant in favor of a New Covenant um, kingdom perspective. 
Well, it, when, 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 when Paul is talking about the Old Covenant, he is no, almost always dealing with the Judaizers who are telling people that to become a Christian, you have to enter into the Old Covenant before you can, you can have faith in Christ and enter into the, into the kingdom of God. And he's saying, no, that would, that would create uh, a division that is completely against everything that he teaches. And so in Galatians, in Romans, uh, over and over again, he's emphasizing the fact uh, that that old way has been done away with. He then turns around and quotes from the moral content of God's law over and over and over again as normative for the Christian congregation. So he's making a clear distinction between the two. And I, I'm assuming the reason we're talking about this right now uh, is because it is that Old Testament law that is so clear in regards to the gender binary and the, uh, the nature of marriage. Um, well, so when Paul, again, it's just that the language that Paul uses um, going to 2 Corinthians 3. Where? What verse? 2 Corinthians 3, uh, verse, starting verse 7. Okay. Um, Letters so, engraved on stone? Yes, mm -hmm. which is the Ten Commandments. I mean, what, what other ordinances do we have engraved on stone other than the Ten Commandments? Right, and if they are viewed as he lays it out in Romans chapter 2, as we possess these things, therefore we're right with God. What does he say in Romans chapter 2? No, you possess them, and that only increases your guilt before God. His whole argument in Romans 1 and 2 is, hey, look at the Gentiles. And Jews are going, yeah, yeah, go get them, Paul. And then he turns around in Romans chapter 2 and yes. says, yeah, well, you possess the law, and you don't keep it. And therefore, in Romans chapter 3, that's why all have sinned, Jew and Gentile. Mm -hmm. There can be only one Christian church because there is only one way of righteousness before God. That's the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who it's for. So yes, if you are, if you are claiming that uh, I know the Ten Commandments, therefore that's my, my get, get into heaven free card uh, or be right with God free card, then yes, he's saying no. But then he, he turns around and quotes from that material as having continuing authority in the Christian church over and over again in regards to morality and ethics. Okay, um, we're dangerously close to agreeing on something. So, I want <laughs> so when you read, uh, let's just ask the first question. So, are you aware of uh, specifically in the Book of Romans of Paul employing an argumentation technique called prosopopoeia? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay, so let me briefly explain it, and then I'm going to ask you uh, a question on that. Um, so there was a, there's a first century argumentation device uh, called prosopopoeia. Paul uses it in Romans. Some say he, he might also be using it in First Corinthians. Um, but it was a common argumentation device where in, in the letter or in the document, it's sort of a mock debate between you and someone you disagree with, right? So that throughout Romans, um, that's what Paul is doing. He's quoting... But you will say and I say. Yes, right. oh, exactly. Sure. It's a back and forth conversation, right? So I, I, I asked you the question because in the way you answered the question about the progression of um, saying, hey, look at all these awful idol-worshipping pagans, aren't they disgusting, kind of stirring up his audience, like, oh my gosh, yes, we hate these people. And then he turns in chapter 2 and says, but you are just as guilty because you know the law, and in fact, you're more guilty because you know it and they don't, right? So it's that kind of idea, and that continues all the way through uh, to Romans 11. Um, so perhaps it's the wrong question for this debate. Um, but if, if when you read Romans through that lens of prosopopoeia, um, it appears that... The, the point Paul makes kind of culminates at the end of Romans 11, and, um, and it probably is the wrong context for this. So. Well, that's because that's chapter 12 begins the, the, therefore, the, the, the practical application of, of given what God has done yes. in Christ Jesus, therefore, this is how we should live. Yeah. Oh, so in the, I have like a minute left. So let me ask you this then. Um, do, would you agree that um, when Paul and Jesus quote the Old Testament scriptures, they quite, they quite often do so in a creative way? And what I mean is, uh, rather than quote the entire passage, they'll leave out the parts about uh, judgment or wrath. Um, Paul, uh, in one example, quotes an Old Testament passage specifically about how God intends to destroy the Gentiles, but turns it around as a blessing for the Gentiles. You'd have to give me a specific text. I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay. So... I'm, that's my question, is I, I feel that you made a comment about how um, Jesus quotes the Old Testament and Paul quotes the Old Testament, and um, so what I would say is that when they do so, we should pay attention to how they do that, and that they do it in a creative way, which sometimes 
takes what is written and turns it in a different direction? Well, uh, I would simply say in response to that, uh, since our time is up, that means I get to talk for a few minutes. No, go, go for um, it. <laughs> uh, I would simply say that it, the, the reason for that is fulfillment. Uh, that is, uh, that there has, something amazing has happened that no one in the Old Testament could have foreseen in fullness, and that is that Yahweh has entered into human flesh. So um, those, there are fulfillment narratives because the vista of the Old Covenant, Old Testament scriptures could only go so far until you have the amazing reality of the incarnation, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, now the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So if you say that makes it imaginative, I would just simply say that it makes it f fulfillment. Okay, we've come to the end of our cross-examination. Um, we're going to have five-minute closing remarks by each speaker, but while we're getting ready for that, uh, if you have questions, send them in now, and then that'll give me the 10 minutes they're doing their closing remarks to look at those last, last questions. Okay, here we go. Last, last, uh, last questions. I won't be able to get to them all, so. Thank you. Just put it right there, yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Thank you so much. Dr. White, are you ready? Whenever, you, whenever you're ready, we'll start. Well, first of all, thank you very much for being here this evening, uh, for taking the time to be concerned about these things, at least in an actual formal debate, which almost never happens in our society anymore. Uh, you get to have pretty much equal time and hear both sides making their, their presentations. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the church here. Uh, obviously, uh, your pastor, uh, believes, uh, similar to my fellow pastor at Apologia Church, Jeff Durbin, uh, he says we need to be godly troublemakers. And uh, that seems to be what, uh, what the pastor likes to do in these particular uh, debates. I think you have heard, and, I, and I, think, I think one thing that has been made very, very clear this evening is that the only way to overthrow the historic understanding of marriage as one man with one woman that Christians have believed from the beginning is to fundamentally change how you approach the text of Scripture itself. Because when you believe that Scripture, not, not a flat Bible perspective, I reject that. I recognize all the different kinds of literature. I recognize fulfillment uh, uh, motifs and everything else. But the fact of the matter is, and I, I hope you saw in the cross-examination, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus' answer to the question takes the people back to creation itself. It lays the creation foundation that can be the only answer to the question itself. And it's not Jesus was saying, well, you've heard that. that was, it is simply in, erroneous to take any place where Jesus says, have you not read and think that he is going to in any way, shape, or form overthrow what is found in Scripture because he's the author thereof. That would make himself contradictory. In the Sermon on the Mount, he's, he's, you have heard it said. That's the interpretation that has been given to the people. But I say to you, and then he takes it deeper into the actual inner life of the individuals. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. You do not have to create over and over again this attempt to create a schism and a division between what God's Word says in its entirety and some teaching of Jesus that, well, Jesus never taught that two men can be married. He never taught 
that there are th three genders or anything else. Being a eunuch is not another gender. None of this has anything to do with Jesus' own teaching. And you heard it said, well, he planted a seed and we're, we're growing it out today. Uh, so that would mean, well, this must be, you know, new revelation or something like that. I have no earthly idea how that works, but that's not how the scriptures work. And by the way, take the time, uh, look up Bob Gagnon, Michael Brown, myself, look up the debates I've done with individuals overseas on these subjects. Arsenikoitai has one clear meaning. The Apostle Paul derived the parts of that word directly from the Greek Septuagint, which is translating directly from the Hebrew, and that is absolutely positively without any question as to what it is referring to. There is no way around that. And so why is this important? I have 90 seconds. A society that wants to have God's blessing, now this society clearly does not. This society is doing everything it can right now to stick its middle finger in God's face. This nation once prayed for God's blessing. It's not happening now. A society that cannot recognize male and female, father and mother, husband and wife, will never produce children that will be able to experience life in its fullness and create a society that will last. We are talking about what will bring this society to its knees. Now, that would be just judgment. It would be. But you see, I have grandchildren. And I don't want them to experience that. And we are teaching them that they are men and they are women and that is good and that is right and God made them that way. And I'm going to guarantee you something. That's how they can have true fulfillment in this life. And you can call me a bigot all you want. Our people will be the ones standing at the end because that's what God will bless. We've been told, listen to what Jesus said. Do so. And if you do, submit to his authority and recognize from the beginning he made them male and female. That's the teaching of Jesus. That's what we need to believe. Thank you very much. I'll give you the, I'll give you the time to them. Okay. I'll give you the time to them. In closing tonight, um, I want to call your attention to two passages in the scriptures. One is in the book of Acts, where, as I mentioned earlier, we read that the first non-Jewish convert to the Jesus movement was baptized into the faith by Philip. And this man was an Ethiopian eunuch. It is the truth that for centuries, Jewish teachers and rabbis recognized six different genders. I guess I said earlier, if you would like to see an exhaustive study of that and the names of all those six genders in Hebrew, uh, please let me know and I can provide those. And those Jewish rabbis considered a eunuch specifically to be a third type of gender, not male and not female. They didn't know how to classify it. They didn't know what that was. They only knew that some people were born that way. And as this Ethiopian eunuch is reading the scroll of Isaiah, Philip comes, comes alongside him and they converse. Philip explains the meaning of the passage he's reading in Isaiah. And then the eunuch asks him a question. What prevents me from being baptized? And I wonder what our answer to that question might be today, to the eunuchs of our day, the non-heterosexual, the non-binary, gay, lesbian, queer, trans, intersex person, who would ask us if they are welcome to be baptized, to sit beside you in the pew, to serve alongside you in Sunday school or to lead worship on the stage, or even to serve on staff at your church. What prevents me? Philip's answer was nothing. 
But today, the answer for many of us is sadly that what prevents them is us. We are the ones who prevent them from being accepted, baptized, welcome. And secondly, also in the book of Acts, I want to call your attention to something quite astounding that happened in Acts 10, 28. You probably know the story if you know the scriptures. Peter is praying on the rooftop of a friend. And as he's praying, the Spirit of God shows him three times a sheet being lowered from heaven, filled with unclean animals. And God's voice says to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now keep in mind, Peter's initial responses are to refuse. Why? Because he knows it is written in the scriptures, do not eat these unclean animals. And so that's his response. He cannot do such a thing. Because to do so would go completely against the clear spoken word of God in Scripture in Leviticus chapter 11. The very same book that we're using today to say no to the people who are not like us. Peter had a choice. He could cling to the Scriptures, as Dr. White says, and he could say, it is written, no, I will not, which he did the first two times. Or, or he could listen to the voice of the Spirit. He could have the mind of Christ and realize something beautiful and profound. And this is what Peter says. This is how Peter expresses the lesson that he learned in that moment. He says in Acts 10, 28, God has shown me that I should never call any person unholy or unclean. Now, it took Peter three times. You might say, well, Peter, come on, three times. But I believe the Christian church has been wrestling with this same question for much, much longer. God, should not sh God has shown me that I should not call any person unholy or unclean. That means no one is excluded, not gay, not transgender, not atheists, Democrats, pro-choice, Black Lives Matter, Marxist, anywhere, anytime, anyone, for any reason. And again, Paul, Peter's choice is our choice. No, it is written in Leviticus. No, I cannot do this. The God's word tells me no. Or the choice to say, God has shown me that I should never call anyone unclean or unholy. I believe we need a t Acts 10 moment today. As I've said many times, I don't believe we should be looking to build a more biblical world. I believe we should be searching to build a Christ-like world because the Bible is not the Christian's ultimate authority. Jesus is. All authority has been given to me, Jesus says. The Bible is not the foundation of the Christian faith. As Paul says, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid in Christ Jesus. Do not mistake the map for the treasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for your patience. I know it's been um, already a, a long night and a lot to ponder. I want to get through as many questions as I can, but I know uh, y'all want to visit with our speakers and they can't be here all night. So I'll ask as many as I can, quickly as I can. Um, since Dr. White's gone first all night, uh, Keith, you're going to get this question first. And I almost hate to ask it, but I kind of think it's appropriate. Um, what is a woman? <laughs> wow. Yeah, great question. Well, again, um, as I said, I, didn't, I don't have the opportunity to read a very long um, study, but um, they are available. I, I will be happy to send that to you. But geneticists have determined that to use this binary male and female is inaccurate, that, um, that there are these six different gender types. There are XX and XY, but there's XYY, there's Y, there's X. There's, there are people that look uh, in every way, and even genetically, uh, appear to be male, um, but they can have children, or those that look female, but they have testes, and, and they can father a child, they can uh, conceive a child. And so um, I don't think it's as easy as that. That's why, again, I said that I think that from Scripture, um, we would do ourselves a better service to, go, to, to look at those Scriptures again and recognize that in the same way 
that it says that God made male and female, that we recognize that there is absolutely a spectrum of male and a spectrum of female. Okay. And the same way there's a spectrum of day and night. 30 seconds. Uh, there is no spectrum. Um, intersex individuals, uh, everyone recognizes that is a genetic error. It is not genetically natural. And the vast majority, 99.99% of people who call themselves transgender today do not have any genetic issue with them at all. So it is a complete canard to even talk about that particular aspect. We should be very sensitive toward those who, are, who actually have a genetic condition. But when 99.99% of these people have no genetic condition, condition, there is no reason whatsoever to make that connection uh, to them at all. Uh, Dr. White, a question for you. Uh, if we change marriage, have we changed the gospel? Or maybe another way to say it is, is marriage a gospel level issue? Well, given the fact that uh, scripture identifies the relationship of Christ to the church within the context of uh, the marriage relationship. Uh, I think very clearly we are dealing with very important central theological paradigms and, and perspectives. And the reason this becomes a gospel issue is Christ dies for sinners. How do you define sin? And if we can't even figure out any longer what sin is, that homosexuality is sin, um, that uh, theft is sin, that adultery is sin, if we can't figure those things out any longer, we have no way, we don't have any message for anyone. That is where the, the, the destruction of the highest view of Scripture and its consistency has led us. And uh, many of us have been fighting that particular battle for a very, very long time. Thanks. Yeah, I would say uh, we define the gospel differently. I believe Jesus defines the gospel in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus says, good news, gospel. The good news is the kingdom of God is within you. And I can preach that to anyone, anywhere, at any time without get, having a conversation with them about their gender or their sexuality or who they're married to. So I would say no, that it's not something that threatens the gospel. Uh, for you, uh, Mr. Giles, uh, in Orthodox Christianity, the husband represents Christ, the wife represents the church. Why should a same-sex union value marriage in light of Christ and the church's representation of fidelity? A lot of there were a number of questions about yes. the bride of Christ. How long do I have? One minute. Oh Lord. Okay. Um, I'm so glad you asked that. Whoever you are, um, here here is something to consider. This is kind of like Jesus says in Matthew 19. Some of you may not be able to bear this at this moment, but I just want you to think of it possibly, just maybe, maybe think of it in this way. Yes, we have this beautiful metaphor in the Gospels, uh, using, I'm sorry, in uh, the writings of Paul um, and in other places, using this metaphor of Christ and the church, right? And Christ is male, that's Jesus, Jesus is a man, and the bride of Christ, though, is a set of male and female, right? I mean, I'm in the bride, he's in the bride, we're a lot of, raise your hand if you're a man, you're, you're the bride of Christ. That's then part of that, that image of Christ a man marrying men and women in this great marriage feast of the Lamb. So I don't think it's outside the picture of what we see in Scripture to consider the possibility. What unites those who are being referred to as the bride is the fact they've all been redeemed by the blood of Christ. That's, what just, that, that's where there's no male nor female because females, males are no more united with Christ than females are uh, Jews and Gentiles, etc., etc. So we are all one in the fact that we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. So it's not some idea, well, there's a whole spectrum of people and that means there's a spectrum of genders. That is an utterly invalid connection to make. Uh, Dr. White, question for you. Do you agree that Scripture is clear about not allowing remarriage after divorce? Uh, I guess, I think what they're saying is as clear as marriages between a man and a woman. Uh, that's a very, very complex issue because it deals that's with the fact question. that, first of all, obviously death uh, deals with that issue. Why a person died. For example, under the Old Covenant law, if you were an idolater and you were... Um, executed under uh, the law of Israel, that means that your wife uh, would now be free to remarry. So that would be a de facto divorce. And obviously, the issue of adultery comes up. What does that involve? And then Paul introduces the issue of what if an unbeliever leaves? 
Okay, so it's not a, a black and white issue along those lines because the New Testament itself addresses the fact that you're going to be dealing with new believers as the gospel goes forth and a wife is converted but the husband isn't. It raises all sorts of the issues that you see in the Corinthian correspondence uh, being addressed in that way, and that's in the end of my time. <laughs> I'm on time, wasn't I? Yeah, awesome. Um, man, so let's just say, um, I, I think, I mean, can you imagine, uh, hopefully this is weird for you, can you imagine on Sunday morning a new couple comes and visits your church, and you find out that one or both of them got divorced for a reason other than adultery and telling them I'm sorry, you know, um, According to Paul in 1 Corinthians, you're one of those groups of people that commit adultery. You're, not, you're welcome in the kingdom. You're a sinner. And so, yeah, you can't really serve on staff. You can't teach Sunday school. I'm so sorry. Um, would you do that to people? Because that's kind of what you would have to do to be consistent with what's happening between Matthew 19 and 1 Corinthians. Uh, Mr. Giles uh, got a lot of questions in this vein, uh, which is, if the law is accomplished in the way that you argue, is murder okay now, too? Um, I know, I know you wouldn't say yes, but there were a number, <laughs> another examples of, of yeah, sins yeah, yeah, that basically yeah. said, well, how do you know what's right or wrong if yeah. the law is accomplished? Right. Great question. Um, yeah, so we're not following the law, the Old Testament, Leviticus, any of those things. Christ fulfilled those things. He's the end of those things. And so what are we left with? Well, we're following Christ and the teachings of Christ. Um, Jesus gives us a very simple command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. And then he actually gives us a, a, a new command. And he says, love one another as I have loved you. If you obey that, you won't murder them, kill them, commit adultery. So it's not getting away with like, oh, good, I don't have to follow the Ten Commandments anymore. It's, it's bringing it down to this very simple place of saying that we're following Christ. We're following the teachings of Jesus. Because no man has ever seen God at any time except for the Son. And if we want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus. Jesus shows us what the Father is truly like. And by following him, we will do the things that Jesus does because Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing. Jesus gave us all the laws uh, that people are so upset about and don't like and want to get rid of and say we're no longer responsible to them. Uh, the reality is, again, when the disciples, and again, once you do the hyper red letterism thing, and elevate just the Gospels and separate them out from the application that Jesus promised. You know, for, for, I don't have time to... Eh. Uh, once you make that, that, that division, the New Testament becomes a jumbled mass that just simply reflects whatever you want to reflect. Uh, Dr. White, uh, a thorny issue perhaps, but uh, is contraception against life? Uh, it depends on the purposes for contraception, and there is no question that in uh, our modern age, uh, the uh, utilization of mechanical and chemical contraceptive uh, perspectives has led to a complete disjunction of the life-giving reality of the sexual act um, and marriage and its purposes and everything else. There's, there's, there's really no question about that. And I'll, I'll tell you straight, straight forward, my generation just completely fumbled the ball all over that one. Um, partly because you weren't allowed to talk about these things in church. I mean, seriously, you, just, you, you, you didn't have conversations about stuff like this. Um, so it would all depend upon the intentions and purposes of, of why we're doing what we're doing. No. I'm sorry, okay. what was the question? No, no I, I don't think that contraception is... Um, a sin. I don't think it's something God frowns upon. Um, I, I, I wouldn't. I don't think that holding that view again would be a Christ-like view. Okay. Um, really, just time for a, a couple of more. Um, let's see. For for Mr. Giles, um, how would you respond to the wrath that God displays toward the unrighteousness explained in Romans 1, 26, 28? And by the way, I got a lot of, I got a lot of questions like, um, exegete this passage. Yeah. Uh, hard, oh. hard to do in a minute. But it, it, Tell me again, Romans 1? Romans 1, 26 to 28. How would you respond to the wrath that God displays toward the unrighteousness described there? One more time. Romans 8? Romans 1. 1? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. 26 to 28. How would I respond to that, to that this, wrath? This, this is maybe too much for one minute. Yeah, my, yeah I'm sure it is. <laughs> it's the homosexuality section. Yeah. Yes. 
I, I, I knew that. I just didn't know it was chapter one. Yeah. Um, well, I think what Paul is doing in Romans chapter one, as I said in my convoluted question earlier, um, Paul is doing this prosopopoeia thing. He has a larger question he wants to answer at the end of chapter 11. He begins in chapter one, kind of setting them up because um, he knows his audience really doesn't like um, these pagans. They're upset about these pagan um, practices that are going on. Um, I, would, I would say that here's an exercise that I think would be very fascinating for you to read Romans chapter one from beginning to end but when it comes to descriptions of the sex acts, make them heterosexual acts, okay, between a man and a woman. And when you come to the end of chapter one, would your assumption be God really hates heterosexual sex? No, because that's not the point of what he's saying in chapter one. What he's saying in chapter one is they do these sex acts, and, and what, what's wrong with that, what's upsetting about it is that it's involving worshiping false gods and f worshiping idols. That is the overall point of what he's saying in chapter one. Uh, that's a, a common misreading and misinterpretation of Romans chapter one. It completely disrupts the flow. Uh, verses 26 through 28 are an example on, on Paul's part of the depth of the, the disruption of the creator-creation relationship so that man, even at his most basic definition, is twisted in his rebellion against God and that manifests itself in male homosexuality and female lesbianism, and these are examples of what happens when God turns you over. Uh, last question for Dr. White, then one more for Mr. Giles, then we'll need to call it a night. Um, uh, I'm, I'm asking this uh, not necessarily for what it says at face value, but I think it could give you an opportunity to speak to what's behind the question. The question is, when was the last time that you socially hung out with someone who was LGBTQ just because you like them? <laughs> As a Christian, if someone is engaging in a lifestyle that is going to bring the wrath of God upon them, my first and foremost, um, if I'm going to be loving to them, is to warn them of that coming wrath. Now, that's very unpopular today. You're just supposed to accept everybody for everything. Um, why, don't we change, why don't we switch that and, and put, put a couple other uh, sins in there? Uh, you know, have you just hung out with any murderers recently just because they were cool people? It's ridiculous. It's absurd. If we understand the cross and if we understand the call of the gospel, then we understand the necessity of being clear and open in proclaiming to people the way they can have peace with God. So if God's spirit brings conviction of that sin, they will know that we will have been used as the, the very means of proclaiming life to these individuals. So if you're, if you're not willing to do that, don't talk to me about loving somebody because it's easy to just hang out with somebody. It's harder to do what's right for them. Um, I found this to be true that you, it's very, I would say it's even impossible to other a group of people if you actually know someone in that people group. So as an example, my wife and I used to work with um, people that were homeless in Orange County, California. And, and by doing that for like 10 years, um, anytime somebody would say, oh, homeless people are lazy, oh, homeless people are ripping you off, oh, they just want to buy booze. I'm like, well, not the ones I know, because I, I know they've been to my house. I mean, they're not like that. And you could say the same thing, you know, fill in the blank. All Muslims want to, they hate us and they want to impose Sharia law. Not the ones I know. They're wonderful people. And so I think spending time with people who don't think like you, look like you, you know, all those things is a great idea. And I think, again, that is very Christ-like. Jesus hung out with murderers and prostitutes, people like that. Okay, last question. I've got a number of questions about the six genders. Uh, oh, yeah. So, uh, and back, to, back to this in one minute. Does gen does genetics or science refer to six genders for all animals, or is this only for humans? And if all animals, why were only two, uh, or while, while were animals taken onto the ark two by, uh, you know, two, you know, yeah, male and female, I, I that sort of thing? Yeah. So I, I think that would suffice. Well, it, they're only taken two by two if you read a certain uh, chapter, but if you go ahead and read another chapter, there, it's actually there's more than two by two. Um, but that, yeah, the, so the, what I was talking about, the research I was talking about, was a very lengthy post um, from someone who is a geneticist who was walking through all those different things about X, 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 Y, X, Y, 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 X, all these different things, and what they see and observe, um, and use these examples of the six different genders, and so that's what I was quoting. And then it just kind of blew my mind. Uh, I, I found that, and then someone sent me 
information about the Jew, from the Jewish perspective that Jewish people have recognized, Jewish rabbis have recognized in their writing six different genders as well. And I thought, whoa, that is pretty crazy. So I don't know if, it, if, that's, if this gender thing um, maps over to chickens and ducks and cows, but I don't think it's relevant to our conversation. For human beings, genetically, yes, there are six different genders. Uh, I think you're right. It is pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> I reject it completely. I, I, yeah. I, I was Department Fellow Anatomy and Physiology. Um, I do not believe. Uh, let, let's put it this way. I think you need to be careful what you read on the internet. I will, I'll send it to you. And it's more than one source. I didn't yeah. just read one guy well, well, posting something. There were, there were dozens of sources that told us that masks were going to save our lives, too. And they were wrong as well. So I'm alive. I didn't die. All right. We'll have the COVID debate uh, next time, perhaps. Um, <laughs> I know it's getting late. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. Please give uh, our speakers one more round of applause. Yeah. Okay. I would like to give our speakers an opportunity to go next door. You guys can gather your things and go through uh, this door. You know the way. Yep. Uh, you know where you'll be. You know where you'll be. Um, and uh, while, they're, while they're getting ready and leaving, if I could have a few guys to help me put this stage away, a lot of, a lot of strong young guys out here, it'll only take a few minutes uh, once we can sure get this guys? table off. I'm pretty sure they're guys. The, the very long beards are a good enough indication for me. Um, when, when you leave, again, when you leave, um, please go out this way uh, and go to your left to go into the, the building next door. Dr. White will be in the room closest to this building on that side of the building, and Mr. Giles will be at the other end of the hall down that way. And just give, uh, give 60 seconds, please, for them, and then, then you can leave. Thank you. Oh man, okay. Looks like I'll have lots of help. Um, let's get these like. Eddie, Eddie, turn off the sound. 